Now this is a video. Well, that's the way in. You will. You see a problem with that? What's going on with it? You know when we found that? We found it in a vehicle inspection of a 15 passenger van that was getting ready to haul 15 passengers on a trip. That's one of the reasons that we do our vehicle inspections. When you look under there and you look at the steering parts and all that kind of stuff, pay close attention to that. When we're doing vehicle inspections, sometimes we have a tendency to just want to get the clipboard and check everything off because, hey, we just checked it a couple of weeks ago. You'd be surprised what you can find on that. On the Crown Victorias that we work on, a 06 model, there was intermittent questions about the brake lights because sometimes the brake lights would work and sometimes they wouldn't, okay? And so one day when we were doing a vehicle inspection on it, lo and behold, the brake lights didn't work. And there was a loose ground, and when I tracked it down, like it was a ground that had a, there was a lug with a screw going through it. it. had never been tightened ever since the factory. But it was kind of on clean metal, and most of the time it was touching. You know what I'm saying? So if the stoplights don't work, and, you know, and you just inspected it, think about it. If this came apart, and I'm not saying we're trying to get away with anything, because we never should, we should make sure we do everything right so that the people are protected when we're, when we're doing the inspection of their car. You can see how if that kept going, it would just come out. Have you ever seen one that the tie rod end came apart on while it was going down the road? You ever seen it? It doesn't just do that. I was behind a friend of mine that was driving a Dodge pickup truck. And he's driving down the road, and all of a sudden, the right hand tie rod end came apart. Your phone to continue. And they, uh, because I said, okay, she wants to talk to me, okay. But anyway, it goes, the wheel's doing like a shopping cart wheel. And he's all over the road. He's on this side, he's on that side, he's on this side, and finally he managed to get over and stop, trying, you know, steering it with the one wheel that still work. But think about what happens if there's a big something coming in the other lane. Bam! Right in front of it. You've seen them videos on YouTube. That's nasty. Uh, anyway, there's another girl uh, that was driving a power stroke diesel. She was in the program. She was close to my age. And she would drove all the way from red level, 60, 70 miles an hour. You know, she drove kind of fast anyway. And she pulled in here in the parking lot and she parked her truck. And it was kind of in the way we were going to do some alignments that day. So she decided she's going to move it. It was like a, you know, 97 model power stroke. It was old. It had a lot of miles on it. And she went to move it from one place to another and the tie rod in came apart and the wheel did that. And she had just driven it from red level. Okay. Now, we're going to change this thing and this guy named Joe was helping me. And so I says, okay, Joel. I said, what we're going to do is, a, you, you remember Joe? Anyway, not Joe, not that Joe, different Joe. Anyway, that, this was before that Joe. Anyway, I says, now what we're going to do to kind of get ourselves in a ballpark when we're replacing a tie rod in, what do you do? You, huh? huh? You can mark a thread. That's not a bad idea. What else can you do? You can count the turns, right? Usually it's about 22 turns. All right, so I'm, at, I'm telling Tony, how do you count the turns on a tie rod in? Yeah, every time you pass 12 o'clock, you're going to count a turn, right, Matt? Yeah. Well, see, I'm watching Joe. I said, Joe, make sure you count the turns when you're taking it off. And Joe was usually pretty intelligent, but this time Joe grabs a hold of it and goes, one, two, three. <laughs> That's not right. I mean, I want a full turn, not your wrist every time you move your wrist, you know. But anyway, we what we wound up having to do is we had to do alignment on it anyway, and you always need to do one. You can use a tape measure and you can kind of get it pretty close, but you always need to do a line on that. But the point is, that's really important to watch catch that kind of stuff. And here's another one right here. Uh, watch this video clip here. Turn that wheel again. Now this is not mysterious. Back and forth. That is not a whole lot of slack. And you might think, well, I can drive on that a while. Maybe you can. But your job, whenever you're out there working, is you can say, you know, this is not likely to come apart next week, but it's got some slack in it, and so we really need to put one of these on there. We need to put it on there when you do an alignment. That's what upsell is all about. I'm not, you know, when you go to a Hardee's or McDonald's and you order your burger, they won't know if you want fries with it or make it into a combo. You know, part of what you're wanting to do, and I'm not trying to say you're selling stuff, people stuff they don't need, but if you catch something like this when you're doing an oil change, they really like it if you tell the customer, you know, if they'll let you say, come out here, let me show you what I've seen on this. And you grab the wheel 
Now, wait with it. So you've got slack here. You don't have to do anything about this right now, but I wouldn't drive it a whole lot longer like this. You need to go have a little, let us put a tie rod on it and do And see if they can see what you're talking about, it's okay. You know, of course, if, you, if you're just going and showing them a worn out part, you pull off another car so you can sell them something they don't need, it's wrong. You know, we don't do that kind of nonsense. All right, I got one more video here. We're going to get into our electronic suspension or our electronic whatever. That pretty bad? Let me hit it play again. I'm sure you saw it. But see, we took the load. We jacked it up. So we just take the load off. And that was a really bad one, too. Sometimes when you're checking a ball joint, you've got to take the load off of the wheel so that you can see that it's worn out. Got me? So anytime you get one up on the lift when you're doing an inspection, grab the wheel this way and this way and see if you feel anything. That make sense? You've done that. We've done that. A lot of you guys have done that, right? I say grab it and move it this way. The inner tie rod end, and I don't even have to put it in here, the inner tie rod end that screws onto the rack will We'll do that. And one time we were having to change one of those on a Taurus, and a 15 six, I mean, in a let's see, one in five sixteenths wrench, I think it is, fits that thing. You know where you screw it off the end of the rack in there. And so we were busting our fanny trying to screw that thing off of there. I actually took a wrench and bent it into a 90. You'll see it in there. And we had a big old bar through there trying to screw it off. It wouldn't already screw it off. I heated it just a little bit with a torch and melted the Loctite and screwed right off of there. Anyway, all right, so now let me get back into this thing right here. I'm going to open up this here, this PPT here. And we're going to talk a little bit about electronic steering and suspension. What has happened to my, to my stuff here? All right, slideshow from beginning. All right, how many of you guys have ever driven a car with electronic steering and suspension on it? You ever doing a car with electronic suspension on it, electronic steering? What in the world would electronics have to do with that? What in the world would, what kind of a car do you think might have electric motor mounts? No, not necessarily. Hybrids have got electric steering, but huh? Of the new models F-150 have electronic steering. Yep, the, the latest ones. Uh, reach up right behind you and grab that thing. See that thing right there with the, grab that one. Bring that to me. Mm -hmm. That's electric steering. This is electric steering module from an 06 Cobalt. 06 is nine years old, and they were on there before that. If you're checking under the hood of a vehicle and you're trying to find the power steering, how do you find the power steering reservoir anyway? If you're not sure where it is, how do you find it? Where's the first place you look when you're looking for power steering reservoir? Find the belt where it's pulling that. You notice the pulley on the power steering pump is pretty big. Why is the pulley on the power steering pump <coughs> big instead of little like the alternator? Anybody ever think about that? Well, the speed is not as important as the power it takes to turn it because it's putting out 1,200 pounds of pressure. Okay. But anyway, this right here on those Cobalts and Pontiac G6s, I think it is, loves to go bad. This is what we changed out. It cost about $500. They had a recall on them for a while. But you'll see people, the terrible thing about these is they'll, they'll be fine and then all of a sudden they'll be really, really hard to turn without warning. And they'll go back and forth. And then they'll go to get it worked on and they'll say, well, yours is out of warranty, it's not covered under the recall we got on these, and so it's going to be, you know, $600,000, whatever they charge, put it on them over some of the lot shops. But anyway, we changed that one there out. And that is, that, this is what I show us here in suspension. So what does that line do? Probably. That actually helps you turn the wheel. And, uh, well, look at it. See that? Does it not have a power steering pump on there? No, it's electric power steering. It helps you turn it. I mean, it actually turns the wheel for you. You turn the wheel, and it actually turns the, it steers the car for you. So uh, it's still got a shaft going on there. Like, well, what do you see here? Think about it. Steady up on that. Power steering pump. It's got an actuator on it. This is electric. This is variable assist power steering that we're talking about here on this particular thing right here. Electronic variable orifice. You got your ignition switch, the diagnostic connector, power steering pump, speed sensor on the transmission, steering sensor. It wants to know how fast you're turning the wheel. It needs to know how hard you're, well, on the ones that are, uh, this is just for the steering. The other thing it looks at the steering is the electronic suspension because it wants to know how fast you're hitting the brake and all that. And so. 
it's on a justice steering assist for optimized fuel. Now there's different kinds of this stuff with the EVO system. Uh, the steering assist level is determined by looking at vehicle speed and steering wheel rotation speed. That's what the deal is on that. Your variable assist power steering has got these. Uh, this is your steering rack, right? These are the inner tie rod in, or I was talking about earlier that wear out sometimes. They're up in this boot. Here's another thing. Talking about steering and suspension, if you ever see oil in this boot, that rack is leaking and needs to be replaced. Occasionally, go run into one that's really funny. People say, I keep pouring power steering fluid in there, but I don't see it leaking anywhere. Yeah, but when you look under the car, this thing right here will be blown up like a balloon because it'll be full of fluid. You see that before? No. What'd you do about it? There's a rack in there. All right, so your variable assist power steering. You see this right here? That's the power steering pressure switch. I'll be pointing with my laser. Power steering pressure switch right there, which the engine controller looks at that. But one way or another, you got an all out return line right there, going back to the steering gear. You got your VAPS electrical connector, variable assist power steering. And then you got your actuator assembly, which is right there, which changes the steering field. Do you want a car that's real easy to steer when you're driving at highway speeds? It feels squirrely, don't it? You want it to feel like a road car. You want it to have less power steering assist when you're driving. Now that Taurus out there, I could take and disconnect the uh, body control module or the gym, and uh, you'd feel the power steering get really hard on it. That's what it defaults to on that one. All right, you got your oil pressure line in coming in right there. All right. This program will change gradually from high assist to low assist because you don't want it happening suddenly. As the speed increases, variations in steering efforts will be perceived as a continuous function by the operator. You won't feel a difference, but the car will just drive better. The reason they took that dark blue Crown Victoria off the uh, road out there was because people were complaining that it was too easy to steer when you were driving down the road. And it's got variable assist power steering. They didn't like it because it felt like it was, well, the way it was described was it was all over the road. A couple of people complained about it, and the car got a lot of miles on it anyway. And so he <clears throat> took it out of service and went around it with it for a trainer car. All right, there's your ZF Servotronic system. Uh, you ever heard of ZF? German company. You know, they made, they made steering gears and stuff for Volkswagens eons ago. Uh, but basically, what you got right here, you got your pump. Reservoir. Now, how many of you guys, most everybody, I've talked about this repeatedly, how many of you guys know that that reservoir, on every one that's got a reservoir on it, it's got a screen in the bottom of it, you know that? If that screen stops up, this will be noisy as I'll get out, in spite of the fact that this is full of oil. Be aware of that. Well, how many we've seen where this was noisy, it's full of oil, they're confused, you take that off, clean the screen out, put it back on, but if they run it long enough, starving that for oil, they will have to have a pump. That's what happened to Willie. I don't know if you remember that. Got a control module here. Looks like there's not much to it. Vehicle speed, that's your, supposed to be your speedometer there. And you got your electro hydraulic transducer. Then you got your steering rack duck. You know, everybody knows what a steering rack is. It contains a modified rotary valve that works on direct hydraulic reaction. Now, just telling you that so you can get some exposure to it. Your speed sensor can either be hardwired from a sensor. It can be hardwired from the other system. In other words, a speed sensor can talk to another module, and the other module can work it over and send it to the control module. Or you can just get it on the network. And a lot of the times people will take, like they first started doing this network stuff, some smart aleck said, well, we got wheel speed sensors talking to the ABS, and it's on the network. Why don't we just borrow that signal and let it go to our other stuff? I know that on the... Um, the older F-150s, like 2,000 mile and whatnot, the speed sensor in the rear end would bring a signal up to the ABS module and it would refine it and send it out to the cluster and the, uh, the PCM and all that. Because it, it needs to know that. Now here's your steering wheel rotation sensor. It's an optical sensor that's mounted on the steering column and it's used to establish the rate of steering wheel rotation. How many of you have seen this thing on the steering column? Under there, under there. When you get on the dash, you'll see this. Even if there's no sensor there, they still put that on just about all these four steering columns. And that sensor is basically an optical thing. And you know this little thing I showed you where I can shine a light in that side and that lights up? See that? Imagine that if you have this putting out a signal instead of burning a light and you got a little thing with windows on it going through. See that? See how that would work? That's not really complicated, is it? 
or uh, so it senses the steering wheel is being turned quickly, like in a high-speed evasive maneuver. The electronic steering model will contain, to, uh, you know, have additional power. Now, if you look at it on a the schematic, there's your optical sensor right there. Not a lot of wires going to it. You can hook a scope up to it, and you can turn the wheel and watch it work, and all that. There's your EVO steering model module that's going to give you that change in steering rate. Got an ignition switch signal that comes to it. You turn on the key. See how that goes there? Hot and run goes through that 15 amp fuse over here. Now, once again, uh, you've got to be recognizing that if your steering is easy all the time, or if your steering is hard all the time, this is where you're needing to look. Uh, there's your ignition switch, your electrical part of it right there. All right. Now, some of them, as usual, some of them for operating strategies, this is to prevent steering column vibration from the solenoid here in key on engine off. In other words, what, heck, what can happen if they didn't uh, tell it whenever you were turning the key on, it may feel the steering wheel will boom, boom, like that. People don't typically like that. And then you, you got module you know, power going to your sensor and all that kind of stuff. Um, the VAPS actuator won't be powered by the module unless the engine RPM signals above a certain amount of level. If the engine is turning slow, like there's something wrong, like the idle air control is not working right and it's barely idling, you know, they don't want to feel they want you to feel that steering column vibration because that confuses everybody, right? All right, there's your electronic electronic variable orifice actuator valve right there. This goes to the pressure hose, feedback pressure circuit. So you just make it a loop over that way. You got your flow control valve in there. All these power steering units have got a flow control valve in there. Power steering pressure pump will have a flow control valve. On some of the big trucks when I used to work on, I say big trucks, I worked on medium trucks and heavy trucks and long bores and all, and that one job I had. And uh, there was a power steering issue that one of them had, and all I had to do to fix it was replace the flow control valve in the power steering pump. Uh, occasionally you'll see a power steering pump that's got a built-in reservoir, it's full of fluid, but it won't pump and it's not noisy like the one that we're pulling the uh, pulley off of out on the bench that some people have done. And, uh, Dustin Reeves did a good job of that yesterday, didn't you, Dustin? Pulling that pulley off and putting it back on. Isn't that right? You were, you were involved with that, weren't you? That's one of the things where he tries, he turns in the sheet and says, I've done this. I said, well, show me, or show him, and he couldn't find his penny with both hands. So we know what happened there, don't we? All right, right here. <laughs> Right, orifice, right there, an orifice. And basically you got an actuator assembly right here. Look at this, anytime you see something on a schematic like this and it has an X in there, like that right there, that typically means there's a winding there. See the actuator where the wire harness plugs in? This is a winding and that's gonna move this. And that's how it's gonna change the, the deal on that. And there's your pencil. The pencil is basically what stops that hole up whenever they doesn't want any fluid flow through there or when it wants to reduce fluid flow by running that taper farther in. All right, so it regulates power steering fluid flow from power steering pump, simple as that. What's this down here? Anybody know? Y'all don't play dumb with me. We'll be here till we're done. How about that? That's the power steering pump. That's what it is. That's what creates your hydraulic pressure and it goes against that flow control. Uh, it's a current control solenoid that moves a needle valve to increase or decrease the size of the orifice. Whenever you change the current, it moves this. It'll move it more if you put more current, it moves it less if you put less, it's spring loaded. Basically, is how that works. And if it's got an electrical malfunction like an open circuit, the EVO system provides maximum power assist, which means you're always going to have a, you know, four of you. Now, here is your variable assist power steering actuator valves, VAPS and VAPS 2. See how that looks? You can see that on there, you know what you're looking at. And the actuator assembly is an electronic stepper motor. It varies the position of the spool valve. The stepper motor can actually move a shaft just little increments and stop right there. And it's like some of your stepper motor idle air control and all that. Uh, varying the position of the spool valve changes the amount of fluid flow. This is not so bad. Here's modules. Uh, depending on the vehicle and system use, the control module may be standalone or integrated with another module. But some modules may, module may be standalone. The strategy of the module remains the same. On the Crown Victoria, the power steering, that electronic variable orifice steering module is under the right side of the dash behind the glove box. This is a standalone module. The airbag module, you know, is up under there too. Uh, but anyway, so the electronic steering module's got a microprocessor that it analyzes inputs like all these things do. Varies the amount of power assist applied by the driver. So you got a pump here, you got pressurized fluid, you got an actuator, and you got low speeds, the driver's gonna have full power assist. Nothing complicated about that. Now if the system fails, it'll stay in the position it was when the system failed. 
That's interesting because it could be either easy or hard. Think about that for a minute. And that's the end of the slideshow. You guys thought we were going to be here for another hour, didn't you? <laughs> it's not too bad. Okay, plus, yeah. Oh, this right here? Yeah. Well, the way this thing is set up, you can still steer the car, it's just hard. It's like driving a car that the power steering belt has broken on. I know, but it's all electric, so what if it just went out? Well, it can go out. Even though it goes out, you can still steer the car the way they got it set up. It's not totally drive by wire. But I'm not sure. You'll have to look that up. That's your job. You're going to have to tell us about that tomorrow. All right. But anyway, uh, I was going to tell you a story about my, my aunt, Leslie May. And uh, she's my mother's sister. And you know what it means when somebody's unflappable? That means that no matter what you say to them, they don't affect them too much. And she was driving an old mobile she had that she just barely could steer because the power steering was out on it. And so she just kept on driving it, you know, hard to drive a big old boat of a car. So she pulls in at the Piggly Wiggly over at Enterprise, which is where Enterprise Bank and Industrial is now. And you know how you just got parking places pulling it off the street? She couldn't get into the, just one parking place, so she just angled it in there and angled across two of them. And this guy was waiting to turn in. He's going to park next to her, but, you know, she's getting the only two parking places there. And so he rolls the window down on his car when she got parked and she got out. I, mean, I guess he knew who he was or whatever. And he yells out of his car across there. He says, why don't you just take three parking places while you're at it? She says, no, I think those two I have will do me just fine. <laughs> well, you know, she's like that. You know what I mean? You can say something to her and she's not going to be bothered a whole lot. <laughs> anyway. All right. That's the end of the today's uh